Welcome to Calumet Perspectives. I'm Neil Nemeth and I teach in the Communication and Creative Arts Department at Purdue University Calumet. Our guest on today's installment of Calumet Perspectives is Pam Riesmeyer. She is the Web Accessibility Coordinator for the University and we're going to talk during the first segment about web issues and uh, disability issues and then in the second uh, segment of our program today we're going to chat about uh, the nature and structure of the media taking full advantage of your former career. Uh, but before we get to that, let's talk about what exactly does the Web Accessibility Coordinator do at PUC? Well, um, we have a Web Accessibility Policy that was passed uh, in 2010 by West Lafayette and handed down to the rest of us. And we didn't really start doing anything with it until um, late in 2011. And then what we began to do was to take a look at our websites and all of the online content that we have, um, whether it's a PDF or a, a Word document or something like that. And our main job is to make sure that any person who, that everyone can, can access that content. Um, someone with a disability uh, might need to use special software, assistive technology, such as a screen reader for someone who's blind, um, that actually reads the, the, what's on the uh, web page to them or what's in the document to them. So our job is to make sure that everything that we put up there actually has the cues and the, the background information that the assistive technology requires um, in order to make sense of it. It's really about um, providing equal access to mm -hmm. everyone and providing the information that we want to present for the university and making sure that everybody has an, a chance to uh, be part of, of, um, of the program and be part of what we're trying to do. My job specifically is to uh, it, it's many, got many facets to it. One is to actually do oversight and to check the website and to uh, check different uh, sections of the site and make sure that we're meeting the requirements. Um, also to make sure that the documents are uh, set up properly. And so if they're not, we actually go in and repair them um, to train people to um, to spread the word, to mm -hmm. explain a little bit about what mm -hmm. web accessibility is, and to help people understand why it's so important and how it really benefits everybody, not just people with disabilities. Um, it benefits uh, people who have different devices like iPhones or iPads mm -hmm. that can't access certain content. So my job is to do that. Um, it's also to um, uh, take part in the system-wide accessibility, web accessibility committee that was just recently formed uh, in West Lafayette. So mm -hmm. representatives of all the campuses are part of that as well. So we're going to revise the policy, we're going to uh, make some changes, but yeah, it's kind of a, 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 a big job mm -hmm. um, with a lot of responsibility and not necessarily a lot of authority, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, it's Good work. It's important to emphasize, I think, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that the origin for this initiative is the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was what passed in about 1990, right? Um, partly. Yeah. Um, it's actually Section 504 mm -hmm. of the uh, Rehabilitation Act as well, mm -hmm. which says that um, any entity like a university that provides programs cannot uh, prevent people from taking part in those programs mm -hmm. and so there's that there's also section 508 of that same law which has very specific rules which apply to the web it's the only law in the federal government that does now we're not technically covered by section 508 because we are not a federal entity but because we receive federal funding there's a gray area there mm -hmm. the Americans with Disabilities Act does not have anything specific so for instance section 508 will say when you have a video posted online, you must have captioning with that video. Mm -hmm. It must be synced with the video. Section um, 508 does have that, but the ADA does not. Mm -hmm. They are making changes. The government mm -hmm. is always revising, and so we are expecting mm -hmm. it, but yes. Mm -hmm. Take us through the mindset of someone who may have a disability and the challenges that they would face in trying to deal with material that is distributed on the web. One of the most interesting experiences I've had is actually watching someone who's blind use the screen reader software he has to use in order to access his the information and struggle with um, a website that was not set up properly. Um, the mindset of a person, just like anybody else, you, um, you want to take part in the grand conversation that's mm -hmm. going on now with computers and, and the internet. Um, you want to access your course content. 
um, you want to be able to be on Facebook just like everyone else mm -hmm. um, and uh, be on Twitter or some of the other things that you do. So, you know, um, I, I guess I'm wondering, um, are you asking what would the steps be or? How about well, uh, perhaps a stumbling block or two that okay. they would have to encounter right. in dealing with web material that was not friendly? Well, uh, there's a great example that I use and I'm one of the things that people who, let's just take someone who's blind, uses a screen reader. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a piece of software that actually reads it aloud. And if you have an iPhone or something, there's voiceover on that. Mm -hmm. Or if you have a Mac, there's voiceover. So that actually it will go, and Windows has the narrator. And it actually will go and read the page to you or read what's mm -hmm. on the screen to you. If you, you know, close your eyes and you listen to it, you can get an idea mm -hmm. of, of what that experience is like. The most popular screen reader is called JAWS. It's Job Access with Speech. Mm -hmm. And it sounds very robotic, the, the mm -hmm. voice that comes with it. So someone who is blind will turn on their computer, JAWS will start immediately and begin to tell them a box appears, um, a cancel button, mm -hmm. a yes or a no. So it actually is it's like having someone sitting next to them saying, this is what's on your screen. This is what you have to do next. Mm -hmm. Click this button that says cancel. Um, if someone, uh, if we don't put the, the kind of information that's needed, then people can be completely lost. Um, a web page, for instance. If you set up your web page and you set it up properly, then someone who is blind can skim it just as you can mm -hmm. if you're sighted because they'll read the headings, the, the screen reader will read the headings to them. If, however, you don't put that structure behind it, they have a big blob of text and they have mm -hmm. to read top to bottom in order to try to make sense of, of what's going on. Mm -hmm. so is that more mm -hmm. what? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you've just uh, been involved in a really major project and then trying to get the university's website into top condition. Tell us about that project. Well, that was part of our web accessibility policy. Um, we had four phases. 25% of the pages had, of our web pages had to be uh, compliant with the policy by 2011, which we missed, 50% uh, by 2012, and 100% or by, yeah, 75% by 2013 and 100% by this, this March. So what we did was we actually worked for um, the last two years in making sure that we trained the editors and that we worked with the people who are responsible for the content to make sure that, that the pages were accessible. We have some software we use to evaluate them, fortunately, because it takes a long time to do mm -hmm. it manually. Um, and so we basically were able to scan them. Uh, because we're, we work on a content management system of WordPress, everything's pretty well contained. And so we were able to make those uh, adjustments as needed. Um, and then we did. Um, we did make the 100% mm -hmm. based on what our software was telling us. Mm -hmm. um, we still have a long way to go. We did have to ask for some exceptions to the policy. But um, at least we were able to say, yes, we got mm -hmm. that far. Sure. So. Where do you see this whole area moving in the future? What are some of the issues that you think are out there that are going to have to be dealt with? I think the biggest challenge we have, it's a culture change, because when you mention the word accessibility, people tend to panic. They, mm -hmm. they wonder, what, is it, what does it mean? My father, who's, who's elderly, could not understand why blind people or how blind people could use the computer, mm -hmm. and he's not alone. Um, so we have an educational challenge on one side. Uh, we also have new guidelines that are coming out, and the policy is going to step up to different guidelines as well once it's revised. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Um, there's helping people understand that this is just really good service. We're, we're really providing good service, and we're, we're making this the welcoming community that we want it to be, the inclusive community we want it to be. So based, I would say that, that the main um, focus for us it's going to be education, mm -hmm. it's going to be training, and it's mm -hmm. going to be helping people understand that there are all kinds of reasons to do this. Mm -hmm. um, not just to help people with disabilities, that's important, but it's not the only thing. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much where we're, mm -hmm. where we're headed, I think, in the next mm -hmm. um, couple of years. Mm -hmm. As a faculty member, it seems like all of this is kind of overwhelming, uh, particularly if you're dealing with a, a large student population. What sort of help and advice do you have for someone who's you know, contemplating taking on, particularly 
uh, with the increase in the use of uh, Blackboard and other such programs, it can be overwhelming for someone taking this on. What sort of help and support can you give? Well, it, it, it is overwhelming. Um, and one of the nice things about what we've seen in the last couple of years is we have support top down. We really have support from, from senior leaders. And one of the things that's in the works right now is a project to to reach out to the faculty and to provide the kind of support, not only the training through the digital learning uh, certificate that's offered by the Office of Instructional Technology, but also to add resources, to add the training, to actually help do the work, to, to move things along. We have a four-year um, phased-in project that's part of this now that's mm -hmm. actually directed directly to the faculty that will involve the course content, uh, that will involve helping, again, the education piece is so mm -hmm. important, um, helping people understand why it's being done. And then we really do have to provide the resources, and that's mm -hmm. not only software but also personnel mm -hmm. to do the training. Mm -hmm. so. On the other side of the proposition, um, where do we stand in terms of trying to uh, reach people and get them to understand that, yes, there are resources to help you? Because I, I would guess that perhaps some people are reluctant to take advantage of the resources that are available. That's another part of our, our challenge, which is the communication piece. We really have, in, in some sense, a marketing issue. It's an internal marketing issue. We really need to to bring this forward and let people know that those resources are available. We have been visiting with department heads. Um, we've been visiting with deans. And we have a couple of, of meetings scheduled mm -hmm. with various departments. Um, we spoke to the uh, construction um, seesaw. Mm -hmm. uh, escapes me, I'm sorry. But mm -hmm. we, we mm -hmm. spoke with that department. Uh, we have a couple more scheduled for uh, May 9th to speak mm -hmm. with um, engineering, math, and science. And also, um, I believe we're talking to the College of Technology. So it's basically, you know, we're, we're reaching out and we're providing, you know, just letting people know the resources are here. We're here to help. We're here to explain and answer questions. And that's been the most important thing, is to let people know that's why we're here. Mm -hmm. We're here so that if you have a question or if it's it, you're confused by it, then please, contact us and we'll be happy to, you know, mm -hmm. work things out. You know, in the final moments we have in this segment, um, how well uh, are the students reacting to this effort and how aware are they? I'm not really sure. I've spoken to the freshman experience a couple of times in chemistry and physics and um, mm -hmm. spoken to other students and I'm not really sure if a student has, does not have a special need, then I'm not really sure that yes. they're as aware okay. as others. Very good. Thank you very much, Pam. Uh, this is the end of the first segment. We'll come back to Calumet Perspectives after a short break. Experience, experience for a lifetime. lifetime. At Purdue Calumet, you'll combine a Purdue education with rich, work-related experience that impresses employers. Experience, experience for a lifetime. lifetime. At Purdue Calumet, you'll take what you learn in the classroom and apply it to a real-world environment. At Purdue Calumet, you'll gain experience for a lifetime. Phone 1-800-HIDE-PURDUE. 1-800-H-I-P-U-R-D-U-E. Welcome back to Calumet Perspectives. I'm Neil Nemeth and I teach in the Communication and Creative Arts Department at Purdue University Calumet. Our guest today is Pam Riesmeyer, the Web Accessibility Coordinator for the University. And in this segment, we're gonna talk about your previous life, professional that is, as a uh, person in the news media. That I was. Yeah, how did you manage to develop this uh, other career early in your life in radio? Well, I went to uh, Northwestern, Medill School of Journalism, and uh, I was newspaper major for the first three years and then decided to switch to broadcasting. 
Um, I was really fortunate to be in um, an area where there was a lot of news going on. So um, I had some great instructors. And um, when I got out, it was in a period where you could actually, it was more of a farm club system. You could go to a small station, and then you could go to a larger station, then a larger, then a major market, and that's pretty much what I did. I traveled from Lowell, Indiana, to Crown Point, to Chattanooga, to Indianapolis, and then to Boston, and then back to Chicago, and finished up in Chicago at uh, WMAQ, and when they closed the station, um, I figured out that there was life after radio, and yeah. that's what I'm living now. Yeah. Wow. It's almost mind-boggling the number of stops that you had, and of course that's part of the career path that people took right. in that, that time period. I think it's vitally important that from having had a similar experience in print, that's where you learn and you make your mistakes in the smaller markets. And, and to some extent, the, the opportunities are not as plentiful as they used to be. No, and that's very true. And you're absolutely right, because I was not ready to go to Chicago. I had an opportunity to go to Chicago from Indianapolis, and I just wasn't ready. Um, I knew that. It, and you do. You make your mistakes in the smaller markets. There are many things that that I did that had I done in Chicago, I would have been fired and, and on my way immediately. Um, I won't tell you what they were, mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, it, it, it was a great opportunity. Now, um, I'm not really sure that you do have that kind of um, uh, luxury, if you will, mm -hmm. to go and to learn the trade and to learn your craft and then, um, then continue to move up as you do. I think a lot of times people will go, try to go directly to a major market. My nephew uh, wanted to be a broadcaster and he's 25. And so he, he went out to Los Angeles and he mm -hmm. actually was working at, at KTLA mm -hmm. and some of the other stations while he was going to school. Um, and for me, that just, it wouldn't have been the way to go. But again, you know, today it's different. Mm -hmm. Now, did you, were you a street reporter or, uh, ever, or was it mostly uh, in the office of preparing the news accounts that you would read? I was, no, yeah, I was um, an anchor. Mm -hmm. I was also an assignment editor because mm -hmm. that was really what I loved. I didn't like so much going out and reporting on one individual story. That really wasn't exciting to me. Mm -hmm. What was exciting to me was being in the middle of all the, the mm -hmm. stuff that was going on and all the stories coming in and then mm -hmm. being able to go on the air and yell, you know, this just in kind mm -hmm. of a thing was really important. Um, yeah, I, I did some street reporting. I didn't like it much and I wasn't great at it. Mm -hmm. In fact, I wasn't even very good at it, mm -hmm. but um, it, was, it was a good experience. And by doing it, I understood a little bit better what the other reporters were up against when I was anchoring. And um, when, you know, understanding that I might want information that they just couldn't get mm -hmm. as an anchor, you know, something to, to I think provide. you probably had more credibility in the newsroom too, if you had that sort of experience. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Tell us about some of the significant stories that you had a hand in presenting to the public. Well, it was, it was interesting. When I was in Boston, um, we, I actually anchored the Challenger um, when it took off and, and we cut out. We and went, this would have been 1986. 1986, this yeah. was 86, yes. The Challenger Space Shuttle with Krista McAuliffe, who was mm -hmm. the first teacher in space. And we stopped the broadcast, you know, we, we just said, okay, it's up. And we, I went back to the newsroom and they turned me around and said, go back to the, uh, to the booth. And um, then we were on the air continually um, for hours because she was from Concord, New Hampshire too. And that was really a very the significant local story. Angle. Exactly. Um, and then um, the uh, Gulf War, uh, Desert Storm, and some of those back in the uh, 90s, um, late 80s, early 90s, yeah. Um, when I was at WMAQ, we were all news. And because of that, which was great for me as a news person, mm -hmm. because we got to cover everything. And so we were uh, live coverage of that. Um, San Francisco, Oakland earthquake happened in, uh, I think, the fall of 88. 89, I 89, think it was. Right. It was in the middle of the World Series. Right, exactly. So it was on the air for that. Um, and then probably the, the largest um, event was the O.J. Simpson trial. Mm -hmm. uh, we took gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage, and I got to be the anchor for that. Mm -hmm. So that was, it was a really interesting experience. Describe for someone who has not had this experience, what it's like to really be part of an event that is happening that's significant and right now. Oh, I don't know if you can describe 
right? I mean, it, it's like any event in your life. If, if you've ever, you know, and, and these days it's different too because everybody is part of a big mm. story. Um, when the uh, tornadoes happened last year and, and everyone was providing coverage in Washington, Illinois and, and other areas, you know, that's the kind of thing where it's just, it's happening now and you're telling other people what's going on. Um, it's less structured now than it was when I was on the air. Um, you actually had to have a radio station in order mm. to be able to talk to people about it. Um, but it's just, um, I think what happens is that what kicks in is a disassociation to some degree mm -hmm. when you're on the air because your whole point is to do the story. You need to be able to um, provide the news and you need to do it in a very calm manner. You can't make your, you can't think about what's going on. You can't think about the fact that, that there are people involved or mm -hmm. that, that tragedies are happening you have to kind of back off of that. Detachment. Exactly. And then otherwise, you know. And of course that leads to the perception that news people are sometimes cold and uncaring. That's not true. No. What is true is that I have a job to do right. and I need to do it in a professional manner. And there, there's a certain part of your programming, if you will, that kicks in during those times. Yes, it, it is. And I think that's part of what you learn in the, in the smaller, or what I learned in the smaller markets, was not to be as emotionally involved in that story while it was going on. Later, that's another story. When you go home or you finished your shift, I remember after the Challenger uh, explosion, then after I was off the air, I was still writing yeah. and um, for the other people on the air. And it wasn't until I got home that I really was able to react and able to feel. So it, it, it's not that you're you know, separating your humanity from your job, it's just that you have a job to do, mm -hmm. as you said. Yeah, can you tell us how you survived as long as you did in what seems to be a <laughs> volatile business in radio? I wish I knew, <laughs> I'm not really sure. I, um, I guess it, it was, I have this philosophy and it's just that if it's my job, I can't lose it. And if it's not my job, I can't keep it. So there really wasn't much I could do. It's a very subjective business. If someone doesn't like the sound of your voice, then um, they'll find a way to replace you. And I was just really fortunate that mm -hmm. uh, the people that counted mm -hmm. liked the sound of my voice mm -hmm. and liked my style. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. Uh, long about the turn of the century, you made a transition. Tell us about that. I did. Um, well, it was pretty much time. I'd been getting involved in the internet, um, working with um, the web stuff. 1996, when the Democratic National Convention was in Chicago, we, we actually had a group, a committee, where we took the live sound from the podium mm -hmm. of the Democratic National Committee and we streamed it live on the web, mm -hmm. which was pretty, you know, forward for that thinking time. for 96. And I really was thinking about internet radio. And then about the time that WMAQ closed its doors, um, the unions got involved with internet radio and pretty much you weren't doing it very much in 2000. So I decided to do something different. I'd been a newspaper major, as I mentioned, in um, school, and the web wasn't too different from the newspaper in the sense that what I really loved was layout. And I really mm. love copy editing, and I really mm. love that whole, you know, central everything going on. So that's where I decided to do. So I flipped over to um, to the web and mm -hmm. haven't looked back. Uh, but tell us more about that, because you you really left what would many people would say you know, brick and mortar type building experience. I report for work, and you were doing it yourself. Yeah, um, I actually came here and was an adjunct lecturer mm -hmm. for um, uh, about five years, I think, uh, teaching computers and office, and um, it was the information systems. And then also getting a degree, I was gonna get a degree in internet web development. Mm -hmm. I ended up with a certificate from here. Um, and it really was, it was nice to be my own boss. Um, it was really interesting to um, do something different. That's my way of, of dealing with life anyway, is I'm always learning. Mm -hmm. There's always something new, and technology allows you to do that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so it was, it was, and it's not really that far removed from the news business, because mm -hmm. there's always something new happening, and so. 
you know, that was pretty so much So from your perspective, your news training is still very much a part of what you do. Absolutely, and um, to the detriment, I think, of some of the people that I work with because uh, I'm still a broadcaster. Mm -hmm. And so I'm still finding things on the Internet and sending them out. And everyone that I know has a PAM file mm -hmm. where all of my email goes to them and they stick it in the PAM file and maybe they'll read it, maybe they mm -hmm. won't. But, yeah, uh, it's still broadcasting, mm -hmm. yeah. What would you tell younger people who are looking at the media field and thinking to themselves, I'd like to be in it, but I'm not quite sure how I would fit? I, I really, you know, I don't know that I have any advice along those lines, but what I do have is um, a real, um, it's important that they, they learn the basics just like we did. Even though it seems as if everything has changed and there's citizen journalism out there and all that sort of thing, you still need ethics. You still need um, to understand the difference between a fact and a speculation and, and mm -hmm. an opinion. You still need to be able to, to um, have the foundation. You still need to learn how to write. You still mm -hmm. need to learn how to be able to put thoughts together and, and to gather information. So I guess um, if you're interested in it, I used to say if people would say, well, I'm going to go into TV, so I, I'm going to go to radio first, I used to tell them, don't bother. Go to TV if that's where your interest is. Mm -hmm. um, just you know, do what you love, I think, more than anything else. I told my nephew to get out of the business, but that's mm. because he was my nephew. <laughs> it had nothing to do with whether the business was a good place to be. But the challenge is if you really want it, if you really are, it has to become your life, I think. To a degree. Yeah. I think it can be. Yeah, I, I think so. There, journalism tends to be a calling more mm -hmm. than a profession, at least in my way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I took some students down for a convention and the keynote speaker essentially said, it really has to become a way of life, yeah. you know, at least in the early stages of your career. Yeah, yeah I think that's, that's true. Yeah. I think that's very true. Any, anything that you would do differently? Last seconds? That oh, we have. lots of stuff. Oh, of course, right? <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I enjoyed every moment of it. I loved the business and I loved uh, doing it and I loved getting out of it. Yeah. And trying Bring something, something new. new. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be who you are today if you hadn't had those experiences. That's what I think, too. Thanks very much, thank Pam Rees Meyer, for joining us. And thank you for tuning in to Calumet Perspectives. I'm Neil Nemeth and I teach in communication and creative arts at Purdue University Calumet. Thank you.